The basic premise of this rocket is child, last remaining human on the planet, wants to get into the stars, mm -hmm. escape from the Earth, which is plagued or something, and doesn't understand that a rocket that has no engine will not fly. Mm -hmm. So this is a rocket with no engine. <laughs> mm. And so it's a symbol of the striving to succeed, yeah. but doomed to ultimate failure. Oh. And I like that poetic idea that the whole enterprise has a bit of that character. Yeah. You know, scientific institutions, especially mathematical ones, can feel a little bit forbidding. Mm. And many people's experience has been traumatic. But I think if you drive up to SFI and you see this absurd rocket, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that could never fly, I think it just, mm. it makes you feel slightly more at ease. Yeah. It is a signal to people that we are trying to enjoy what we do. Mm -hmm. And that there are, there are mysteries here that are confounding even to the brightest minds who show up and have no idea what the backstory is. Exactly, yeah. yes. If you came onto the campus and saw this, you'd think, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. I've come to the Santa Fe Institute because I'm hoping to make some progress in my journey to try and get yeah. closer to some answers to life's big questions. I've already visited with a bunch of different scientists in a number of different contexts. Wow. And I've learned a lot about astronomy and particle physics. But I haven't figured out how to integrate that into some sort of big picture. The Santa Fe Institute is a place that was born out of a desire to break down the boundaries between scientific disciplines. Founded in 1984 by an august group of scholars who wanted to look at how things like physics, biology, and computer science might be able to help us better understand the messy stuff of life. They wanted to create an environment where experts in their respective fields had the opportunity to engage in a kind of free-form, transdisciplinary collaboration. Considering the incentives in scientific research for staying in one's lane, it's not the sort of endeavor that seemed likely to succeed. But the credentials of its founders, Nobel laureates among them, combined with their conviction, brought SFI into existence. So a lot of things about the Santa Fe Institute that I find really interesting. Um, it has a kind of monastery vibe to it here in the high desert, up on a hill. You got these buildings crammed with really thoughtful people doing interesting work, thinking novel thoughts. But these are people who are contemplating some of the deepest questions about existence and consciousness and the meaning of life, why things are the way they are. There's something really inspiring about that. Um, and in that respect, well, yeah, I guess it is not like a monastery. It's just a monastery, because that's what you do in a monastery, right? The focus here is on studying complex systems and colonies, market economies, cities. The dizzying complexity found in all of these self-organizing systems emerges through the interaction between smaller constituent parts the folks here at SFI are looking for the underlying rules that make all of these systems behave the way they do. And they're driven by the expectation that some of these rules may actually be applicable to any number of different systems, perhaps unlocking answers to some of life's biggest questions. In this episode, we journey to New Mexico, diving deep with the brilliant minds at the Santa Fe Institute to uncover how their boundary-pushing insights might shed light on humanity's eternal search for meaning and purpose in our vast, miraculously complicated, rapidly expanding, and incomparably mysterious cosmos. This is Dispatches from the Well. And this, of course, is the inscription at the doors of Plato's Academy. And this is essentially says, of anyone course. ignorant of geometry shall not enter. Which is a bit harsh. <laughs> <laughs> David Krakauer is head of the Santa Fe Institute. This charismatic, Oxford-trained evolutionary biologist is a true polymath with an astonishing range of interests in the sciences and beyond. 
These are helpful attributes to have since David is leading what is perhaps one of the most intellectually diverse and genuinely interdisciplinary institutes of scientific research on the planet. David is responsible for so many things. He's corralling all of these diverse intellects, trying to keep his finger on the pulse of what's happening in all of these various interdisciplinary studies, and also handling all the minutia that goes along with just running an institution like SFI. But while he's doing all of that, he's constantly on the hunt for new talent to bring into the milieu at SFI so that they can help inspire great thinking and do even more interesting work. So how long have you been at SFI? Too long. <laughs> can you put a number on it? <laughs> Just over recall? 20 years. Just, okay. Yeah. In terms of the architecture of yeah. the building, yeah. is it, was it largely as we see it when no, you came? No, what this was is this part of the building was a house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the basic premise was no corridors mm -hmm. and the ratio of open space to individual office space inverted. Mm -hmm. okay. and so, so yeah, so you'll have an archaeologist with a quantum field theorist. There's no, there's no departments, there's no divisions, there's no labs, none of that nonsense. You look like you're being very thoughtful over there yeah, on board. I'm taking advantage of the office spaces we have. Yeah. Did you <laughs> see us coming before you started performing? I did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you reminded me of something that you've shared with me before, these three Ms. It's mm -hmm. the mountain, monastery, metropolis. Yes. Could you put that into context for me? Yeah, you know, I've, I, 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 I'm very interested in this idea of what makes for the, a creative environment that's hospitable and stimulating. So this led to this tripartite creative workflow, which is if you want to be really original and challenge convention, you better be on your own. Mm. It's a solitary pursuit. That's the mountain, you go into the mountain. But at a certain point, you've drunk a little bit too much of your own Kool-Aid. And you need a community that is congenial and understands you to give you honest feedback. That's the monastery. You're, you're Benedictines, you're Cistercians, you're friends. You're the same order, same values, but you're still competitive. And that's, that's where you take the idea next, to really cultivate it in community. And then when you're pretty certain that it's robust and correct, you take it to the metropolis where everyone is out to kill you. Mm. and trade it with the world. Mm -hmm. I view SFI, right, as the monastery in the mountains. Your role here yes. at SFI is one in which I imagine you're curious about all of these topics, yeah. but you're also helping to, are you adjudicating yeah. disputes? No. Are you facilitating, just creating an environment for them to unfold in? I think a lot of people feel uncomfortable with the unknown, the uncertain, the noisy, the unresolvable. But I don't. So here for me, it's people first. Mm. I'm very interested in quality of mind. And then quality of mind in community that you don't feel aggrieved or put upon when someone doesn't agree with you. And none of us here agree with anybody. I mean, you know, that's the game. Mm. Uncertainty and debate are not negative. I mean, mm. not knowing and discussing and arguing to come to knowledge is what's desired, right? Mm. So in that sense of embryonic idea of what the scientific method is, you know, this sort of like harmonics, mm. there's, a, there's a resonance of, 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 of approximate truth and then it goes out of tune mm -hmm. <laughs> and you fight again and then it comes back into tune. And so I, I think my role is partly to just make it a very comfortable environment for people to feel they can do that. That uniquely collaborative environment is part of what drew theoretical physicist Jeffrey West here decades ago. They said, look, you should come here and do whatever you like, because you could do whatever you like here. That's the whole point of this place. And I thought, great, you know, no administration, no bureaucracy, you know, and so on. It sounded perfect. Jeffrey would eventually end up running the place, serving as SFI's president in the mid-2000s. He left and then came back again, and what I noticed is that there seems to be a real gravity about the place. SFI draws people back to it over and over again. So while Jeffrey helped shape the culture at SFI, it seems obvious that he benefited from it in tangible ways too. I wanna just talk about your career yeah, um, okay. and your life as a scientist. How did you arrive here? <laughs> I've always been fascinated by you know the usual 
kind of childhood sophomoric questions about what is it all about? Yeah. What's the meaning of life? Those sophomoric questions are the questions which, that which never me. end, sure. which yeah. never end. And uh, and I was attracted to science, uh, and I was very good at mathematics. Mm -hmm. So it was a good good combination uh, that led me to um, getting my doctorate in physics. I was recruited to build up a high energy physics group at Los Alamos across the valley. But meantime, this place sort of started to evolve in the 80s by a group of uh, very distinguished scientists. Uh, and their concern was much more that there are these big questions to do with the, so to speak, you know, the messiness of the planet. And these are really important questions and they cross disciplines. And they felt that there should be a place that brings them all together. But I, to be honest, and I'd probably get killed for this, I didn't think it was serious. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Well, I, I just felt that it was kind of a retreat. You know, they weren't going to do serious science. But I was completely wrong, because by that time, in the in intervening years, from the mid-80s to the mid-90s, I began to appreciate that there were equally fundamental questions that were to do with what's on this planet, namely life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm wondering if, if you feel as though you have sufficient answers to those big questions now. The meaning of life, why yeah. are we here? Why do I care? So how do you sneak up on those in well, a way that doesn't just leave you exhausted? It does leave me exhausted. <laughs> well, it leaves me, uh, well, puzzled, of course. First of all, let's see, I'm gonna back off a second. Okay. Um, of course, one of the great puzzles, which people have asked, is um, the role of mathematics, mm. the generality of it. Mm -hmm. And that in some very simple, trivial way, it was saying something powerful mm -hmm. about the universe. Even <laughs> and that led me much later in life, in fact, much more recently, to realize to, to uh, in my own formulation of what the whole point of this is, what the whole point of everything is. Mm -hmm. There are only two points, as far as I can tell. Okay. One is to love and to care. Love meaning in its general sense, because as far as I can tell, nothing else on this planet and nothing else in the universe cares about anything. You know, those trees or the little animals running around, they don't care. But we, we do terrible things and we've done terrible things, we as on this planet. But we're the only part that actually cares and has morals and ethics. And I think that's extraordinary. So love, I consider that. So that's one thing. But something supersedes all that. The point of it is to understand. The whole point that we're, this whole exercise, the whole thing of whole society and of, you know, of having evolved consciousness to whatever, the whole point of all of that was for us to understand because we are the force of the universe so that the universe can understand itself. Otherwise, it's meaningless. I'm walking through the forest and I see all these trees and I admire them and then suddenly I realize, my God, I, I know there's order. Those trees don't even know it. But somehow I've been blessed with this whatever that I know this. There's something kind of platonic about it that was wonderful. And that was a kind of spiritual experience, I would say. And some of my, the work that I do has brought me to that. And, uh, and I think that's why we're here. It's hardly surprising to hear a decorated scientist talk about understanding as one of the reasons for our being here. But to have him pair that with something as universal as love is a bit surprising. And while it's not necessarily what I expected to hear him say, it's a response that resonated with me in a really profound way. It also seems to be a real indication of just the kind of unique place the Santa Fe Institute happens to be, where researchers can go from discussing the intricacies of quantum mechanics to talking openly 
about these universal human values and feelings and to connect those things with the work that they're doing here. So there are a few things I wanted to ask yeah. about. Um, but one in particular was the iconography mm -hmm. that I see above these doors. Oh, Can you oh, tell me what's going yes. on? Yes. We have a press, SFI Press. So I thought we need to design our own book with our own SFI font. Okay. And the idea was this is a font that no one can read. Okay. And I was particularly interested in this in a bloody-minded way because people will often go to bookshelves and they'll just look at the spines, they won't even bother putting the book out. So what, what I want you to do is all our books to have unreadable spines, <laughs> which is silly <laughs> and childish. And so, and it, you can't be in the Library of Congress if that's the case. So we had to capitulate and give in. And so what we, but anyway, so you'll see all of our literature and these are number systems um, and alphabets have our SFI font glyph. Okay. And so what these are, are in fact numbers, what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've come to understand that there is a method to David's mischievous, freewheeling approach to scientific research. It reflects the intellectual culture at Santa Fe Institute. It's a place that allows its researchers the freedom to think about things that they aren't expert in, in unique, interesting, out-of-the-box ways. It encourages this kind of cross-pollination in a way that other places simply don't. I think it might be essential to the work that's being done at Santa Fe Institute. See, the core of what they do here is complexity science, an inherently interdisciplinary field of study exploring the many adaptive and emergent systems that make our lives possible with the specific goal of providing a clearer picture of the world than any one research discipline could. Now that's a mouthful, so we'll try to drill down here. Think living organisms, financial markets, climate systems, or even pop culture. You could, for example, have a sophisticated understanding of how human cellular biology works. But would that really give you a better understanding of why Pokemon is popular? To understand that, you actually need to understand culture and economics, trade flows, the science of color, the history of video games, child psychology, even intellectual property law, and plenty of other things. That is a complex system. And what has emerged from the interaction of all those component parts is the highest grossing media franchise of all time. One of the daunting things about trying to get to the bottom of complex systems is that you need to understand extraordinarily different disciplines of scientific research. And the reality is that for people who spend all of their time studying one field, specialization, they can often have a very difficult time having conversations across fields. If you look at the way that we come to understand the world, there are poets, there are musicians, there are high energy physicists, there are mathematicians. What is it about the universe, living and non-living, that seems to require very different forms of expertise? Now, there are people who say, you know, we don't. In the end, it's just quantum field theory. <laughs> All that stuff, it's just noise. <laughs> if we really understood the universe deeply, we'd just all be physicists. Mm. And of course, many of us consider that very muddle-headed. So how do you explain the need for new ideas, new disciplines, um, at different scales of organization? And that's where emergence comes in. And it turns out that one of the interesting properties of the universe and mm -hmm. the world is that it can be understood as a set of hierarchies, each of which becomes somewhat independent of the levels below, right? And understanding how that comes about is the emergence problem, right? So if, and the way I often say this is that, you know, if you go to a new city and you need to get around, and you go to rent a car, what you need to understand is the map of the city, not the physics of the engine. Mm. And COVID for me was the come to Jesus moment of reckoning with 
excessive specialization. Hmm. Because what happened with COVID, it was a virus, right? It becomes an immunological problem, that becomes an epidemiological problem, which becomes a transport problem, which becomes an economic problem, which becomes a human well-being and professions problem, which becomes a school problem, etc. So what happened during the course of the pandemic is that our sensibilities matured in understanding that what we were dealing with here was a complex system. There were other dimensions to this problem that were being neglected precisely because we were not reckoning with the interconnectedness of the system. So it's not just that it's the neglect, it's actually pathologically dangerous for the well-being of the planet that we do this kind of atomization all the time at the level of the disciplines. For David and his colleagues at SFI, grappling with complexity in an interdisciplinary way is a matter of urgent importance. They can't presume that people who are outsiders in a particular field don't have anything to offer when it comes to understanding some important question that they've been wrestling with. Or perhaps even shed new light on an urgent concern that we're struggling to put into words. It's the Cormac McCarthy reading room. <laughs> so it should be no surprise that perhaps one of the greatest wordsmiths of the English language, the late Cormac McCarthy, found a home at the Santa Fe Institute. Yeah, I don't know. People, people ask me why I'm here. I'm here. I'm here because, uh, you know, um, Brian Arthur likes to say that the, the the best thing about the Santa Fe Institute is they really have good crack. Well, crack is a Gaelic word, C R A I C. It means yeah. chat, <laughs> and uh, and that's what you have here. You have really good chat. Yeah. You know, and uh, any given day you may learn something just astonishing. Yeah. But that's why I'm here. It's not, I, I would normally live in Santa Fe. It's a little bit artsy for my taste. <laughs> but I tried to get them to move the institute to Texas, but they said... Thank God that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they didn't think that yeah. was a good idea. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so this... Cormac McCarthy desk. Mm -hmm. And um, he just colonized any available space, <laughs> you know. And he liked this, it was quiet, it was in an environment of books. He would work anywhere, you know, it's funny. I mean, one of the places that he really loved working, I'd see him, is in Baskin Robbins. And he loved coffee ice cream. But he, he would take the typewriter take over Take the Baskin typewriter, Robbins? take his pen. And can you tell me <laughs> what he worked on at this desk? Starts with the road, no country for old men, uh, Stella Maris, the passenger. Wow. And right next door, which is so funny, was Sam Shepard, huh. working at the same time on his version of Oedipus, A Particle of Dread. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Whereas we, yeah, work on Galactus. Well, that works too. <laughs> yeah, you know. This is yours, I assume. No. <laughs> <laughs> this project of, of kind of reconciling the humanities and the sciences what is it that inspires that specific project? My litmus test, my Turing test of people is that, is just this restless, curious mind that doesn't second guess the kind of ideas that are gonna make their work better. Artist, scientist, painter, composer, doesn't matter. Um, we had to transcend the boundaries of the natural and the social sciences. Hmm. That distinction couldn't hold. And so we, we just got rid of it day one. I remember when I was first talking to Sam Shepard. He came in, he doesn't like science. He never liked scientists. He thought scientists were hubristic. Mm. They thought they understood everything. Whereas his world is a world of enormous doubt and strife. But qu very quickly he found himself in a community that actually resembled his own. So there was him finding that cultural affinity. Now look at someone like Cormac McCarthy. The fuel, the coal in his fire was always intellectual, philosophical, scientific, mathematical concepts. So for him to be a writer of the kind of writer he was and became increasingly towards the end of his career, he couldn't be anywhere else. Just curious about, obviously, this extraordinary literary re legacy, yeah. but the very particular kind of legacy here at SFI. Of Cormac McCarthy. Yeah. That's a very 
raw question to ask in a way now because it's so recent but but important and um there are just lots of dimensions to him in this contribution and and one was his surly iconoclasm right um but as a model for what it means to kind of go solo there's that um there is the work ethic. All day long, I'd hear him typing on his Olivetti, the Chara 22, type writer. All day long, it's like, <laughs> and I go to tea and I come back and he's still typing. I think, well, you, know, what am I doing? <laughs> you know, so there was this other side, which was great work requires a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And the other side was that synthesis, that distillation of ideas into representations, in his case, aesthetic. That process of distillation and abstraction, either into aesthetics or into testable models and theories, that we have in common. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually consider that the hallmark of, of a really great mind, which is the extent to which you can own something. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't really invent anything out of whole cloth, right? We, but we synthesize, yeah. if we're fortunate, and we make it our own. And I think that seeing how that's done, you know, mm -hmm. daily for over 20 years, that was really illuminating. Wandering the halls, it still feels like there's something of Cormac in the place. And I'm beginning to understand why he fit in so well here, contributing to the conversations, the good crack that you find in places throughout the Institute. But especially here at the lunch table. So wait, is there a finite amount of energy in the universe? You would know most. I no, think, I, <laughs> I, you know, if you take uh, the total energy of the universe today uh, compared to when it was uh, very close to the Big Bang, Every day at noon, most of the people here at the Institute gather in the atrium for lunch, and they often wind up in these heady conversations that will last into the late afternoon. It was genuinely inspiring to be able to sit down with them and leap into their conversations, to eavesdrop on them talking openly about their uncertainty, wrestling with ideas that they were currently considering, and oftentimes discussing ideas that they perhaps only recently had set aside because they realized there was no there there. All the answers beget more questions. <laughs> At some point, you gotta hit a wall. Is there frustration when you reach a point like that? You recognize all of these nested questions? I don't know, you just paint a picture. And you leave things out and you put things in. Yes, you know, but the process is the, is the fun part. Is the, the process is the, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the important thing. And, you know, uh, if we recognize that uh, as human beings, we are just in some intermediate step in evolution, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think uh, I find it easier to come to terms with the fact that um, we are not going to solve all the problems. Why should we be able to solve all the problems, right? Um, because after all, uh, there's nothing ultimate about us, right? It's just um, there's something ultimate about me. <laughs> Sorry? There's something ultimate about me. Why? I am. I see myself sometimes, you know, like as a mushroom. So, you know how when you see a mushroom, it's like the fruiting body of a huge organism underground. Mm. There's like all the threads of information that led to me, which is, you know, DNA that I got from my parents, that they got from their grandparents and so on information that I got now from you, all the bacteria that I have in my body, all of these things came together in me and I'm now this individual, but this is not actually the individual, it's like the mushroom. It's mm -hmm. the, the individual is the whole organism underground. Mm. Yeah. But, but that gives a sense of purpose, right? I mean, sure. there, is, there is a sense of agency. Mm -hmm. There is a sense of being part of perhaps some larger project, which is, uh, um, you know, which is which is which is unfolding. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to have anybody's purpose in it, but to be able to do one's bit, to add to the complexity 
to add to the mm -hmm. you know to the intertwining to the uh, to to the creation of new structures right is is a purpose the average person goes about their day they go to work they go shop at Costco keep the fridge full pick up the kids and bring them home they don't have this other aspect of the conversation that perhaps allows them to imagine themselves as this mushroom that is producing information contributing to the something i don't know i think that if you think about all the people who just at home you know sit and write poems mm. that they don't show anyone or mm. take pictures because they want to do like art or uh, you know read books and read books to their kids or i think like other than all the authors we know and all the artists we know and all the scientists we know like it's nothing compared to the vast universe of the real artists and the real scientists that are kind of underground so i don't know hmm. i don't know if we're allowed to say that there's like these people that just go to work and come back and go to sleep and never think about anything i don't think they exist or i i don't know i mean i don't know them but i but i've read a lot of popular science books and listened to a number of public intellectuals and i'll often hear descriptions of the universe to say it's purposeless obviously the universe generated purpose right i mean that's obvious right i mean uh, i have a purpose you have a purpose like every time you go to eat something you have a purpose sure so the universe obviously generated that others you will find a whole spectrum of people who um who will think more about these things or less about these things so there's no establishment uh, mm. view uh, on on these uh, if there is if any uh, you know the only view is that these are difficult questions <laughs> thank you all for indulging me um, i imagine your uh, your conversation is usually a lot more enlightening than what i brought to bear but i enjoyed it thanks for thanks for, yeah. thanks for coming in yeah. <laughs> and, and asking you it's <laughs> okay <laughs> is this the best way to get to the monolith yeah let's through? go this way So we've arrived at uh, at yeah. one of the monoliths yeah. here on the property. Walking up to it and touching it is part of the ritual. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, it has its origins in the film 2001. And this is the, you know, Arthur C. Clarke Kubrick singularity technology. Mm. So the, yeah, so it's blackboard. <laughs> <laughs> it's also over 1000 pounds of slate. So it's an artwork and it's functional. And you know, I don't know, it was a symbolic of this utopian idea that humans in conjunction, almost in a symbiotic relationship with primitive technologies could do incredible things. Mm -hmm. Slate and chalk, it's almost like a cave wall, right? Yeah. I love that idea of, I'm writing this thing on a 2001 monolith, you know, it just, just add that little edge of, of, of humility, actually. A kind of playfulness that, you know, most of this is going to be garbage. Most of this is going to be wrong. Mm. And just, that's okay, you know? And, it's, and I think if you know that, you, it's, it's not about taking the pressure off. It's just giving you a better sense of what you really are going to do here. Among the many things David has been working on here is developing a theory of life. In 2021, he co-authored a paper on the topic with astrobiologist Chris Kempis. Now, astrobiology is a curious field to even imagine existing, but it totally does. I wanted to talk about you personally and how you developed an interest in this particular area of science. And go back as, as far as you can. Yeah, so um, as a kid, I had a dual interest in dinosaurs and stars. Mm -hmm. um, it's always the dinosaurs. It's always the dinosaurs. And I think for me, the, the key kind of interest for both fossils and outer space was um, sort of an indescribable sense of vastness, mm -hmm. right? So just how big time can be, yeah. you know, how distant these very radically bizarre creatures in the past um, could be, and then how just vast space was. And so I would go around telling people I want to be 
an astronomer and a paleontologist. Um, and I think in a weird way, that's an astrobiologist um, huh. because we use the principles of the history of life to try and look for life in space. What is it you all do? To, to explain to someone? Or do you work directly with Mulder and Scully? Or how does this work exactly? <laughs> so we're thinking about looking for life in the universe. Um, but a lot of what we're trying to do is develop general theories of life that even tell us how to search for life. So part of what we can do is look at the huge diversity of life we have on our planet mm -hmm. and use that diversity to try and extract some general principles. Do you give much thought to the probability that life on other planets is going to be like life here? So my answer to your question is sort of yes and no. I think there's a whole bunch of features of life that are absolutely contingent to our own um, evolutionary history here. So I don't think life elsewhere uses exactly the same molecules that we use. For example, I, I think DNA as a genetic code or even as a genetic molecule is unlikely to be preserved across the universe. But the idea of storing information is very general, and I think that's always beneficial to life to be able to, to store information and propagate it into the next generation. So I'd be willing to bet on genetics, but I wouldn't be willing to bet on DNA as the molecule um, that does genetics. You did something really sneaky there a moment ago. When I think biology, I think mm. about cells and stuff. Mm. But when you were talking about life, you described it in this broader way, mm. like the preservation of information, the transmission of knowledge. Could you talk a little bit about what life actually is, how that's different from biology, and if that's a distinction that we need to be more aware of? Okay, we don't fully have a theory of life yet, um, but what it may start to look like is um, a bunch of traits, all of which live on a spectrum. So you could think about intelligence as a certain sort of trait that lives on a spectrum. You could think about individuality as a trait that lives on a spectrum. Mm. Um, and some combination of that equals life. And so we think that once we start to expand the perspective of life, we may realize, oh, there have actually been other origins of life after the initial one um, where most of the processes of life are present. I'm wondering if finding these parallels between different fields. And obviously we're, we're kind of limiting ourselves to Earth for the moment, mm. knowing that there are these laws that seem to govern like mm. evolutionary biology and the development and emergence in the cosmos broadly, if that makes you more or less optimistic that there is other life, even if it is very much not necessarily like ours. Realizing that there are these general processes that show up over and over again should give us hope for finding life elsewhere. I mean, it should make the likelihood maybe seem higher than we would expect. Because you could say, well, there's lots of types of processes that could lead to this sort of runaway evolutionary trajectory where things um, get more complicated. You know, I'm sort of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I think life is everywhere. Yeah. And the rest of the week, I think it's super rare. Is and it, Are you sadder on, on the rest of the week? or? Well, I think it implies different things. Okay. So if, if life is incredibly rare, it makes us think about human culture and, and our own planet in a much different light, right? Because it tells us just how rare and special this planet is. And many of our challenges become about preserving life, not just preserving humanity. But it's nice to think about life everywhere in the universe, mm -hmm. um, to think about it being a general process of the universe rather than a specific process of our planet. As the sun set, I broke out the unistellar telescope that I've been traveling with for a few weeks now. This is my third child. Hoping that the dark skies in New Mexico would finally give us an opportunity to do some serious stargazing. This would be the first real stargazing experience. We can help you. Please. Okay, right now we're shooting a dark frame and calibrating. <laughs> okay. There you go. So you're tuned in. You want to go to a galaxy or someplace? What do we got? Uh, sombrero. Sombrero is really nice. Sombrero is beautiful. Okay. Wow. Um, that's pretty cool for tonight. Wow. Uh, so you're talking about Santa Fe Institute? Uh-huh. I'm currently a friend of the Institute. Okay. At points in time, I've been artist and uh, naturalist in residence. 
But right now, I'm a radio astronomer, and the last 10 years I've been working with transient luminous events. And what are they exactly? Well, they're optical flashes of light generated by a super strong lightning stroke, and they look like big kachinas in the sky. They're psychedelic, hmm. and uh, they're incredible. <laughs> um, if it's okay with everyone, I'd like to invite other people to come see what you guys are seeing. Sure. Yeah. 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 Hey, it's neat. Well, <laughs> yeah. uh, One of the first times we went out together, he said, do you want to see the moon to Jupiter? There's a good line for you. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, what is and how would you define nebula? Um, yeah, free floating <laughs> gas in space. Yeah. Gas, gas, <laughs> dust. Gas, and, gas, gas and, and dust. There's a perception of science as rigid and closed. But to really make any headway in trying to understand this strange and mysterious world that we all live in, <laughs> you have to be open and creative. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. <laughs> I'm thankful that there are places like this monasteries of the mind where thoughtful people can come together, forge community, and explore questions about the nature of reality. While the work here is rigorous and driven by data, it is unconstrained by orthodoxy or the boundaries erected between disciplines. You have these people who are contributing to the community who are primarily artists, spinning narratives about the world around them <laughs> in whatever medium they work in invested in the same big questions and bold insights. What I'm perhaps most moved by is the culture of generosity and humility that exists here. <laughs> As David said to me, it's precisely those who choose not to learn who are confident. Let's see where M13 is. At the moment, the only thing I am really confident of is that I still have a great deal to learn. And so our journey continues. It's the end of the evening. And we've done a bit of stargazing. We looked at some, some nebula, some galaxies, and everyone is listening to me, waiting to see if I'm going to say something really profound and I'm going to disappoint them. I wasn't sure if anyone was gonna come, uh, but then we got a nice cross section of folks and uh, yeah, good company is fine company. I made that up this afternoon. I think it makes sense. That's it. <laughs>